Hello, hello, lovely people. Welcome to my virtual couch. Happy Friday to you. So today we are going to talk about addiction, specifically chemical dependency. This is something that is plaguing the country, really the world. So I've got one of my experts here to talk all things addictions. I want to thank you for the questions that you all submitted. And uh, we're going to get into it. So um, welcome, Kevin Holmes, to the virtual couch. How are you? I'm fine, Pam. It certainly is my pleasure uh, to be a part of this. I think this is a great opportunity, hopefully, just to educate people um, uh, about addiction and, as you answer some of the questions that people may have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So why, why don't we start with an introduction of yourself Okay. Um, and how you got into becoming a master addictions counselor. Okay. Well, I graduated from the Howard University Graduate School of Social Work way back in 1987. <laughs> and uh -huh. my first job after graduate school was actually as a medical social worker at a instant detox facility that was hospital based. Um, this was at DC Hospital, um, which no longer exists, but at the time had a 21 day inpatient uh, detox unit specifically designed for those individuals who were abusing the drug PP, um, known as cyclidine. And back in the early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, uh, PP was epidemic proportion uh, in Washington, DC. And so they decided part of their public hospital to establish a detox um, just for PCP. And so that was my first job um, after I graduated from Howard University with a degree in medical social work. And it just fit me working with that population um, substance abusers and drug addicted individuals uh, fit what I want to do as far as helping others. And uh, I held that position for, for 13 years. Wow. Wow. That must have been very tough, though. I'm sure you saw a lot of different things. I did. But as you well know, when we're in this profession, we, we, we do have to take on uh, a lot of trauma, a lot of pain, uh, a lot of uh, uh, you know negative consequences that people are experiencing. But my role is to help. Right to be there, to whatever situations they're dealing with, better or to be improved. Mm -hmm. So although yes, we have to take all of that on, because we have sort of the helper's role, um, you know that that kind of helps me to. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how would you define addiction or chemical dependency? What would you say your definition of that is? At its root, I would say addiction is when a person has a compulsive behavior regarding a specific act activity or a specific drug. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that compulsive behavior, um, they're starting to experience negative consequences, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes people may be aware of the negative consequences associated with the behavior and may be willing to admit that there are negative consequences as a result of the behavior, but, but not always, right? Um, I tell people that very often the most dangerous symptom of addiction is denial. Mm, is okay. denial. So a lot of times people will experience addiction behaviors and not even recognize it. Other people may be suggesting to them uh, that they need to take, take their behavior. Uh, consequences may start to happen and they'll blame it on other things other than the addiction. Um, so at its root, addiction is any type of compulsive behavior that results in negative consequences, but the individual continues to engage in those things. 
Mm -hmm. I noticed you said drug or activity. Yes. Okay. And the reason I think with that now um, is because of what's been going on the last few years. For the majority of my career, um, addiction was always, you know, substance based in terms of alcohol or drugs. But what has happened increasingly over the years, and more recently because of uh, the pandemic, I'm seeing a lot more clients who are experiencing behavioral addictions in terms of uh, gambling, pornography, mm -hmm. sexual addictions, um, shopping addictions. Mm -hmm. So I separate those from the chemical dependency and put them more in the behavioral category of okay. addictions. That makes sense. That makes sense. Because sometimes people don't realize that it's not just drugs. There are other things too that can cause negative consequences. Like if you have a shopping addiction, yep. then I'm not paying my bills or I'm in default or I'm in debt. And that causes issues too. Absolutely. So and, yeah. and, and, I, and I often tell people that the most difficult addiction to deal with is a food addiction, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because we don't have to gamble. Our life isn't dependent on gamble. We don't have to use alcohol. We don't have to use cocaine, but we have to eat, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So for those, yeah. normally you would tell a person that the solution to their addiction is after, right? Stop, right. <laughs> you know, stop shoplifting, stop. You know, stop using marijuana or cocaine, but you can't do that with the food. Mm -hmm. So with That's the food true. addiction, a person actually has to develop the skills for moderation and not abstinence. And that makes it tough. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So what would cause someone, what would trigger someone to become um, addicted to a substance or an activity? Well, there, there's lots of reasons. Um, probably the most uh, basic, which a lot of people aren't aware of, is just the genetic disposition, mm -hmm. uh, predisposition towards addictive behavior. It has been well researched and well documented by the National Institute of Health that addiction can run in families. Mm. And mm -hmm. not because of behavioral factors, but because of genetic factors. Yeah. There are yeah. genes that people can pass on in terms of family lineage that yeah. can be people more susceptible to addiction. Mm -hmm. So I always mm -hmm. know your family history, right? Know if you have, you know, parents or, or, or grandparents who have a history of alcoholism. Because, mm -hmm. because if you can be that gene, then you have to be particularly careful about your own relationship with yeah. alcohol. So yeah. one of the things that determine addiction is, is just a pregenetic condition. And also, in, in a lot of cases, addiction can be trauma mm -hmm. as well in terms of making an effort to find something to self-medicate mm -hmm. um, or, or to moderate any trauma, or any type of negative uh, mood experience they may be having. So they see it as a solution to their trauma. They see it as a solution mm -hmm. to their depression. They see it as a solution to their anxiety. Yeah. The goal of becoming addicted, but just that can just happen. Yeah, like oh. I don't want to feel the pain anymore, so I, I need to turn to something to numb that pain, yeah. And for them, whatever substance they're using is not the problem, it's actually the solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Wow, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. So what do family members, because I would imagine somebody that's, Addiction doesn't just impact the person, right? right? It has a trickle effect, right? Families, jobs, things like that. 
Right. So what do family members need to know about a loved one who is suffering from addiction? They need to know that it's been well document, documented and proven that addiction is a disease, right? And the reason it falls into the disease category is because if someone continually uses marijuana or cocaine or alcohol, it literally changes their brain chemistry, mm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as a result of changing and altering the brain chemistry in a negative way, it's going to make that person more dependent on whatever substance they're using or whatever substance they end up becoming addicted to. Yeah. yeah. A lot of times, families don't either understand that or don't believe that. They mm -hmm. see it all as an issue of, of willpower, right? Mm -hmm. So the mm -hmm. first thing for the family member to realize is that they've got to approach it like any other type of disease that a family member may have. Yeah. Right? Okay. And once they recognize that what it is, disease, then their obligation, their role, or their responsibility is twofold. One, to let the loved one know how their addictive behavior is affecting the rest of the family, mm -hmm. right? To, to confront them with the specifics of how the family is being affected by that addictive behavior. Because mm -hmm. I said that primary, um, one of the primary of addiction is denial. Yeah. Right? So to counteract denial, remember, really has to be clear and specific about what the consequences, not only to the individual, but what the consequences are to the family mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of that person's addictive behavior. Yeah, yeah. The second step would be to let that person know what the expect expectations are for them changing mm -hmm. that behavior, right? Mm -hmm. To be clear about the expectations that the family would like to see the individual change as far as that behavior, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then the third part is probably the most difficult for family members, and that is to clearly communicate to the individual who is addicted what the consequences will be mm -hmm. if those changes aren't adhered to. Oh, I can imagine how tough that is. Sure. That would mean even like, I might cut you off. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and so, you know, and, and if you genuinely love and care about the person who has the addiction, that's it's hard to inflict consequences sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? It's hard for a wife to say to her husband, well, if you don't stop drinking, you have to move out. Mm -hmm. It's hard for a, a father to say to his daughter, well, you, you know, if, if, if you don't stop using marijuana or cocaine, then you're on your own, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. so it's, it's not only important that the loved one express to the addicted person what the consequences will be, but they also have to be consequences they would be willing to enforce. Yes, right. If, don't just say, I'm going to cut you off and you don't do it. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's I'm exactly not going right. to give you any, any more money and then you don't do it. Then you're sending mixed messages. That's exactly right. And, yeah. and once again, the addicted person may not even realize that they have a problem. So if you take away the consequences, then you're also taking away any motivation for that person to change. Uh-huh. Yeah. So I want to go back to what you mentioned before when you said it's genetics, right? Because I, I, I see that a lot in, in when I'm counseling family members, right? Um, that's something that I think it is not, it's not stressed enough. And the way that I like to compare it is think about like diabetes, right? Like if you go to the doctor's office, they ask you, do you have a family history of high blood pressure, diabetes? high cholesterol, right? It's just that there's so much stigma yep. around addiction that it gets often overlooked. So I'm really glad that you mentioned that, but I wanted to go back and elaborate on that. I'm glad you raised that point as well, 
um, Pam, about the stigma <laughs> that has come over the decades with with, with addiction. Mm -hmm. um, I can tell you from experience of a lot of my clients, you know, if, if, if a client shows up in an emergency room intoxicated, they get treated very different than mm. a who shows up in, in, a, in an emergency room with, with you know, a headache or, or high blood pressure or, or something yeah. like that. So yeah. even within the medical field itself, unfortunately, mm -hmm. yeah. they go even further, Pam, within the mental health profession sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There, mm -hmm. there, there are some therapists and psychiatrists that won't work with anyone yeah. who has a substance use disorder. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because wow. They feel dealt with first. And that may be true, but, but, but you don't want to deny the person services that they might be able to benefit from immediately because yeah. of the disorder. Absolutely. I got a lot of questions. I got a lot of um, questions about this one. Is yeah. addiction a mental illness? <laughs> you said it's a disease, right? <laughs> it's, it's yes. And, and, and it, it's yes, it's a mental illness and it's also a medical disorder. Um, and, 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 and let me get to the specifics because I think that's a great question. And I think people should really understand um sort of what the basis of addiction is when i was teaching my, my classes my class, i would ask people when a person drinks alcohol what do you think is the most affected organ in the human body when a person drink, drinks alcohol and, and not to put you on the spot Pam, but we'll put that. The, the liver kidneys yes yeah and guess what, Pam? That's what 99% of the people will say asking that question. Yeah. But guess what? They're wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> Educate me. Okay. The, the organ most affected when a person drinks alcohol is the brain. Right, right, right. Okay, right. okay. So okay. whatever effect a person gets from drinking alcohol, whether it's blurred speed, whether it's the loss of balance, whether it's possibly blacking out or passing out, that's not because of what alcohol is doing to their liver right. or their kidneys or to their stomach. It's because of what alcohol is doing to their brain. Okay. And that's the first thing people need to understand about addiction. It's actually a brain disease. Wow. Right? Okay. So when we, we, we now, have chemicals in our brain that are designed to do certain things as part of our very existence. Mm -hmm. You've heard of dopamine. Mm -hmm. You've heard of serotonin. You've heard of endorphins. Yeah. You've heard of adrenaline. And these are all natural chemicals that the brain manufactures and produces to make us feel a certain way in certain conditions. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. What happens when a person starts to use too much alcohol or too much cocaine or too much marijuana, those drugs mimic the same effects that our brain has or experiences when we're producing dopamine, adrenaline, serotonin, and endorphin. Okay. So what happens over time is as that person uses more of the cocaine or uses more of the alcohol or uses more of the marijuana, that signal to the brain, well, I don't need to make my own dopamine. Yeah. I don't need to make my own endorphin. I don't mm -hmm. need to make my own adrenaline because I'm getting it from the drug. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what happens that literally those external drugs, marijuana, cocaine, heroin, whatever, begin to replay our own natural internal yeah. drugs. Yeah. Okay. And so the brain then becomes dependent on those external chemicals. Yeah. And that's where the compulsion comes from. Okay. Okay. Because we're really talking about the chemical restructuring 
as a result of excessive use of external chemicals. Oh, I am learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the function of that matter. Um, yeah. Anytime you start changing brain chemistry, you're talking about a medical condition. Right, which is important for people to know. Yeah. What are the trends that you're seeing now that you didn't see years ago? I touched on it a, a, a little bit. I, I tell you, um, as I first started my career, 99.9% of the clients I saw as far as addiction were all substance use issues. Mm -hmm. What I have seen over the last maybe five years, but what has really exploded during the last three years are more behavioral addictions, right. necessarily yeah. chemical based. And when yeah. I say behavioral addictions, I'm talking about gambling. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about pornography. I'm talking about sexual addiction, right? And so there has been an explosion mm -hmm. uh, of these types of and I think I think the 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 COVID pandemic and all the isolation that people were experiencing helped to contribute to that because they couldn't go to their normal things. We were literally cut off as a society. You couldn't go to the gym, you couldn't yeah. go to movie theaters, you couldn't yeah. go to the bowling alley. Yeah. So people were looking for ways to, you know, relax and feel good. So, yeah. you know, we 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 have gambling, you know, pornography sites. We have all of this kind of stuff that yeah. handy to us by technology. Just mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, I, explosion of of. of of people coming forward and being willing to admit, yeah, wow, yeah, 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 and so that's really the, the trend over the last couple of years. Okay, so so let's talk treatment. What is the process in getting into treatment, and what does that look like? Well, the, the first step is really to do an evaluation uh, of the person. And, and I'll just talk mainly about drug and alcohol addiction. Mm -hmm. To do an evaluation of the person's um, addiction, um, because there are, there's mild alcoholism, there's moderate alcoholism, and then there's severe, right? So the first thing you want to establish is what is the severity of that person's um, substance use disorder, because that then will dictate the, the treatment that, that might be necessary. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, when you're talking about more severe cases of addiction and chemical dependence, you're usually talking about detox and some form of inpatient mm -hmm. to help get that person in a safe environment where they can stabilize, begin to get tools and insights as far as their addictive behavior. Yeah. With mild and moderate substance use disorders, very often they'll start outpatient um, sometimes intensive outpatient settings or hospitalization setting mm -hmm. um, you know just to help them stabilize um, and begin to develop the tools as far mm -hmm. as um, you know dealing with or manage their substance disorder behaviors okay. and of course medication plays a role a as well uh, yeah. there are medications that can help people um, as far as uh, cravings for substances, <laughs> which will, which will um, you know, be able to assist them as far as eating whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. I got a lot of questions about this too. Is treatment lifelong? Um, and what would cause somebody to relapse? Is treatment lifelong? <sighs> Like, do I just go into rehab and I come out and I'm good? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that's right. <laughs> Treatment is like in the sense that at any moment, at any time, the body is susceptible to relapse. Mm. And the way I frame this, Pam, is that 
some drugs, I mean, I'm sorry, some conditions you cure, right? Some medical conditions are curable. Mm -hmm. Other medical conditions just go into remission. Mm -hmm. And the difference between you're cured of something, you don't have to worry about it. It's gone. Mm -hmm. As opposed to if it's in remission, it's still there, it's still present, but it's just not actively symptomatic. Right. Okay. Addiction falls into that latter. If an alcoholic stops drinking, they're not cured. Mm -hmm. Their alcoholism has just gone into remission. Got it. All it takes for that individual to become an alcoholic again is for them to make the decision or to give themselves permission to start drinking again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of alcoholics and substance users make that mistake very often. Wow. They'll say to themselves, well, you know what? If I stop drinking for 30 days, if I stop drinking for 60 days, that might mean I'm not an alcoholic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a false premise. Yeah. yeah. Being able to stop doesn't determine whether or not you're an alcoholic. It's what happens once you start drinking. Yeah. That determines whether you're an alcoholic. Yeah. So the disease is like wrong. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But yeah. it can go into permission. Okay. You may be okay. somewhat familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I know clients who haven't had anything to drink in 5, 10, 15 years, because they still do. Yeah. They still go to AA meetings. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they know that they're only one thought, one day, one trauma away from making a bad decision mm. to start drinking again. Yeah. 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 Wow. And, and this is another aspect of. of a lot of people may find difficult to believe, but it's true, is that a lot of alcoholics, once they stop drinking for a while, and then they decide they're going to drink again, they almost quote this exact same quote. And I don't care if they stop drinking for years, five years. More than not, they'll say, when I start drinking, I picked up right where I left off. Wow. Right? Mm. And, and that, once again, because of how the brain responds to things that we've been addicted to. Yeah. Once you develop a tolerance to something, you will always maintain that tolerance, even if you're drinking. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that's a hard thing for people to accept. So it, in that premise, it, it, it is a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, a uh, 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 process, and mm -hmm. that's they in AA. They one day at a time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Are there any resources that you can provide about learning more about addiction treatments? Sure, absolutely. Probably the two best are both sponsored by the, uh, the federal government. They do a lot of research and study um, on on addiction. One is. The National Institute of uh, National Institute of Drug Administration, also called NIDA, NIDA, and they are a division of NIH. Um, okay. But they're they're charged with you know doing the research, during the uh, the studies, putting out the information on uh, substance use disorders, uh, behavior, and treatments. They're they're sort of the cutting. Edge and that's where a lot of the medications that have been used to treat people with addiction come from, studies mm -hmm. done by, by NIDA. Um, so they have resources there. And then the other one I would recommend is, it's called SAMHSA, and that stands for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. Okay. Okay, and they are a very good resource because not only do they provide information and papers about addictions, they also provide um, resources in terms of 
where people can go. Okay. Treatment. It's a national resource, uh, very user friendly. Um, you can just go to their website, enter zip code, and it will show you um, treatment facilities available uh, based on your geographic location. Great, thank you. And I'm going to put those resources in the description like when this video uploads. Where do you practice and um, how can people reach you? Sure. Well, for the last 21 years, I was with Kaiser Permanente and, and their behavioral health department as a psychotherapist specializing in uh, people with uh, addictive disorders. Um, retired January 1st, and I have been in the process of setting up my own private practice uh, of therapy. Um, so as far as uh, uh, email, it's um, my first and last name, Kevin Holmes, K-E-V-I-N-O-L-M-E-S at Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, counseling services.com. Awesome. awesome. People can also <laughs> call me directly. Um, at my office at 240-786-7322. Okay. And I will put that information in the link below as well. I Thanks. have learned a lot. So I know that if I have learned a lot, I know that people are really going to benefit from this. I really want to thank you for taking the time out to provide education. We really need it. So thank you so much, Kevin. My pleasure, Pam, and thank you for this opportunity because the first step of solving any problem is learning about the problem. So yeah, I absolutely. The opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you so much. My Time pleasure. Okay.